nine. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we may more properly understand the symbols that are being presented and apply them to the situations that we are currently seeing at this time in Earth's history? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we have great need of you. We have need of your spirit for which we ask. We have need of the protection of your angels for which we desire. Direct us as we meet together today. Show us today that which we should understand in this portion of the book of Judges. Help us each one that we may understand to come together in unity, in spirit, and in truth so that these things may become clear to us and we may be able to explain them clearly to all of those with whom we come in contact. Be with us now. I thank you for each one that is attending this meeting and for all that will listen to this later. For this, Father, we ask, for this we pray, and for this we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. How did we do in our assignment? Have we gone back over, beginning in Judges 9-7, to begin to look at these symbols so that we're prepared for today. Now, as we were speaking yesterday, as it is written, as when they told it to Jotham, he went up and stood on the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. This area between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal was important. We have Jacob coming to this area to remove the family idols that his beloved wife, Raquel, had stolen from her father. He removed these items and buried them under the oak. We have Joshua coming to this area, putting the tribes half on Mount Gerizim, half on Mount Ebal. But he also erected a stone monument near the oak to remind the children of Israel of what their responsibilities were to be. Here now comes Jotham. Gideon, or Jerubal, has passed. His father, Gideon, did not seek to become king. Jotham did not seek to become king. Yet, his half-brother, the brother of his father's concubine, has now sought to become king. We are applying this as looking at this as a message. Mm -hmm. So that which Abimelech is doing, yesterday we were addressing my premise that this is a representation of a false third angel's message. Now, this is a false call to judgment. It is a false health message. And here is Jotham. He is reminding his relatives of that which has gone before. But he is now making a prophecy. As he is making a prophecy, 
he is doing this not in a literal version, but in a very symbolic version. Mm -hmm. Why is he speaking in symbolic language? Well, okay, so there's a number of things. So we know that, that this is a message, and this is one of the 70 sons that survives. And we take the 70 to represent the 70 weeks. And, right. Right, and Jotham is the 70th week. So it's a prophecy that addresses the 70th week, the week of Christ, we would call it. Okay. And if we remember that in that study, which uh, – was first done in 2018, we found that the prophetic mirror that comes from Leviticus 26 is um, parallel to the literal week of Christ. So, so that means we have here uh, the blessings and the curses, which is Leviticus 26, being represented. And this 70th week message is standing, standing on Mount Gerizim, which is the Mount of Blessing, right? Giving this message to the men of Shechem who have just made Abimelech king. So the making of Abimelech king is a counterfeit message, right? Correct. Understand. And then we're going to have this message of Jotham uh, being given in symbolic language dealing with these trees, an olive tree, right? Um, a fig tree and a vine and a bramble. So there's going to be four of these trees, it, though technically the bramble is not a tree, right? Okay. So it's a three-one combination. So it's a representation of the three angels' messages, or the lines, correct? Agreed. Okay. And we have um, different things being represented. So we know what the olive represents. We won't know what the fig represents, and we know what the vine represents. So, so at least we should know. Now, your question is, why is it in symbolic language? Right. Okay. Well, because it's a symbolic message. We are applying this message of Jotham to our time right now, correct? Mm -hmm. Because, because we applied the message of Gideon to the July 18, 2020 prediction. Correct. Is going to be what follows. But it's not something that's an external enemy. It's an internal enemy. Agreed. That's now being addressed. So the other ones were external enemies that were left to test us. But now we're brought down to this internal enemy. And it's specifically within this message of July 18th. That we have right. this other aspect arise. Now, my just my simple understanding of this is that this would refer to the to what we found with the seventieth week, with the week of Christ study, is that it led us to April fifth, twenty thirty, being the first day of the first month, and then at this time in this history that we're now illustrating, we have exactly this. Uh, prediction, if you want to put it that, or this prophecy, which comes from that study. And that is July 18th leads us to understand whatever 2030 means as a symbolic date. It's, it's connected to a reproof of the interpretation that is being made regarding the pandemic, being made regarding Trump, etc. So specifically uh, the messages of Odilio and Colin, which we don't see as complete error, but there is other things attached to them. That is, it's the interpretation. And we also see that we have this emphasis upon uh, the health message in this movement and a, um, the health message, though, in a distorted manner, and also a false 
message of righteousness by faith. Two things which Jeff had constantly fought against in his ministry are now being manifest in this movement. So it's the message dealing with the 70th week or the week of Christ that is the answer to that. And here it's being represented in this parable of these trees and the bramble. Agreed. Okay. Now, a comment from the chat, which I find very interesting. If we um, if we do an ordinal count of something, then we are taking it from its beginning to approximately the the end, but we do not include the end date, right? I know I'm shifting gears for the moment. Okay. Well, in an ordinal, ordinal count, you count you you use both the first and the last. An, so ordinal ordinal count, an ordinal count, when it's expressed as a cardinal number, is called inclusive reckoning. So three day, three days, for example, if you say three days, but you're talking about the third day, <coughs> you're using inclusive reckoning, but. In a, as a cardinal count, it would normally be considered two days. Okay. So I find it interesting. From the chat, <clears throat> there was published an article by Mrs. White on August 4th, 1881. Yeah, which is uh, today, but Correct. a number of years earlier. Depending on the count, we would either have 140 or 141 years. Right? Yeah. Um, so it's what's what's the year again? 18 1881. Yeah, so it would either be 141 or 142. No, to, this is 2022. Right. So if you just did a, a straight cardinal count, that'd be 141. If you did an in uh, an ordinal count, it's the 142nd year. Okay. It's the beginning. You would say there's 140 years in between, but I would just take it as 141. Okay. What I find interesting, when you, when you take a look at this article from Signs of the Times, 4th of August, 1881, taking a look at paragraph 11, Mrs. White writes as follows. Pride and ambition similar to that which cursed ancient Israel exists in the church of God today. They are unwilling to be a peculiar people, distinct and separate from the world. To reach the Bible standard requires self-denial, a crucifixion of the affections and lusts. The unsanctified heart reaches out for forbidden things. But these very objects of desire will prove now, as anciently, a source of weakness and corruption. Christ gave himself for us that he might cleanse us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Those who seek the honor which comes from men are ever ready to adopt the customs and practices of the world. They gain their position by the exercise of traits of character, which should be dormant. If only those were exalted who had gained their position by fidelity to God and to man, the standard of morality and religion among the people would be elevated. The sin of which we are guilty in acting contrary to God's expressed will is as much greater than was that of ancient Israel as our light and our privileges have been greater than theirs. Okay. Now, this one paragraph, is this written in the past tense or is this written in the present tense? Well, it's the present tense. Right. Is she directing it? strictly to the church of her time or is this directed at us well it would be directed at us i mean obviously she's addressing it to the church at her time 
uh, because she says the Church of God today, and that's when she lived. But we know that the prophets write more for our time than for their own. But this is definitely paralleling what we have today in this movement. Exactly. This is showing us specifically our great need of what Christ is offering. This is showing us the figure of Jotham crying out to us from the top of Mount Gerizim. Now it's and it's interesting that really this is where Ellen White writes the most about Abimelech, right? Um, otherwise, it's just cursory references to it in a couple of other places, and um, that it happens to be the same date as we're studying this, I think is quite interesting. I would agree. Yeah especially if we're applying this as a figure of 141 as of the 14th day of the first month yeah now she's going to continue um after the death of abimelech on the next the next week august 11th 1881 so again another important date but here in this in this section, she uses the name of Bimelech, 678, 25 times in that, about in that um, uh, uh, article, where, you know, the number of, well, it's pretty much the number of hits that, that it gets, the number of uh, sentences that the name of Bimelech gets in the spirit of prophecy. <coughs> Is right. 24 is 24 hits, but that's because if it's in the same sentence, they only count it once, even if it's twice. So the other places are uh, patriarchs and prophets. It's mentioned twice his name, and in SDA Bible commentary, it's mentioned um, three times. Whether it's the um, but whether it's the same one. Uh, here, because there is other Bimlex, I didn't check them all out. But anyway, this is this is the main article where she talks about a Bimlex. This is the main place in her writings, and it happens to be today's date. Uh, so, I think that's very interesting. I agree. Yeah. Okay. So, so, but it's also the message that's given here is a message that would describe the problem that this movement is facing. And, and this is, of course, common to human nature. It's, we're not in a new, unique situation. It, it commonly occurs. Um, but people, you know, the reason, the reason that many people profess to believe the truth is not necessarily uh, uh, pure reasons. There's lots of reasons why people will attach themselves to a message that is true while unconverted. And so we have to examine our own hearts and take these statements here and see if they apply to us. Agreed. The, the one sentence, they gain their position by the exercise of traits of character, which should lie dormant. Right. And, and this is often the case. People... Um, well, you know, th there's the saying that the cream rises to the top, but also the scum rises to the top as well. Um, and so we see that often people have false motives or impure motives, and they use aspects of their character to gain position, either in the church or in a movement. And, and the question is that we have to ask ourselves is do we or have we exercised traits of character, which should have lain dormant. Throughout this, 
I can look back on my own life to understand mm -hmm. that there are many traits of my character which should have, I should have allowed to remain dormant, but I did not. Mm -hmm. Well, I think all of us can say that. So that makes you feel better. I'm not looking to feel better. I'm just admitting my, my own errors in this situation. Right. And all of us should be able to recognize that because I don't think that there is a single person who could say that all of their motives are pure and that everything that they have done was something that was Christ-like. So, so we can't change the past, but we have to look at this now and take this quite seriously. Agreed. So now, <clears throat> here is Jotham speaking from the Mount of Blessing, <clears throat> speaking to those around him with all of the symbols, with the oak, with the large stone, speaking to the men of Shechem. And how do we see these men of Shechem? What exactly is there of the men of Shechem that is important for us? Shechem is a ridge. Mm -hmm. In another way of looking at it, we could also say Shechem is a cliff. There are those that will willingly run off the cliff in following what they think to be true. There are those that will look to avoid the cliff because they know that there is great danger in coming from and off the cliff. <clears throat> His parable, the trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, reign over us. The trees, all of the trees are approaching the olive tree. They are approaching one item that is a symbol that is used within the sanctuary. Yeah, and it also represents the Holy Spirit, the oil of the olive. Okay. Does anybody have a problem with those, the recognition of those two items? Now, we could read Psalm 133, which talks about the, the oil that flowed down from Aaron's beard. So it's definitely talking about the priesthood. All right. Yeah, we also, of course, have uh, Zechariah dealing with the two olive trees and, of course, Revelation. But as we are, as we are looking at this, we have the olive tree that gives us the fruit, the olive itself. It also gives us olive oil, mm -hmm. the lamp for our feet, because without that oil, there would be no light within the holy place. Yeah, so um, now the thing about these, because we're making a parallel here uh, with the 3-1 combination. Um, now, I'm not sure what, what this would mean that the, they ask the olive tree to rule over them, but the olive tree refuses to, and each of the trees that are offered refuse to. So there must be a reason why. Well, okay, look at this in a different manner. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. Mm -hmm. And what was used to anoint the king or anoint a priest? Well, the olive oil. 
So they wish to anoint the olive tree with its own oil. Now I look at this and I, I have to wonder why this symbol? Why are the trees looking to anoint that which produces that which is used to anoint? <clears throat> so we have multiple references here of the sanctuary and of the anointing, such as how Christ was anointed to go forward. Yeah. He, after his baptism, the spirit came down upon him. Correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have the olive, and we have the fig, and we have the, the vine. So, of course, the fruit of each of these is different. Right? The olive tree produces the olive fruit and the oil. The fig tree is a symbol of the church. At least Christ uses it as a symbol of Israel, and it's used as a symbol of Israel. Um, and if each of these represent a message, um, then we also have the vine, which produces grape juice, which represents um, doctrine. Right. Um, so neither one of these wants to rule because they each have their own place. These messages have to be combined in order for them to accomplish their work. Um, so are they rep are, are each of these, where we're dealing with the olive tree, the fig tree and the vine, are these each representational of the messages of Revelation 14? Well, that's what I'm saying. The first, second and third angels messages. And it is Judges 9-11 that's the fig tree. Right. Should be the second angel's message. Now, isn't that interesting? Judges 9-11. Mm. But it's Judges 9-11 that gives the rejection of the request of the trees. Mm-hmm. So is this paralleling the rejection of the second angel's message? Well, it has to. This has to be a rejection of a message. It's the tree that's doing the rejecting, but these are symbolic of messages that are being rejected. Right. And if you reject the three angels' message, then wouldn't you accept a false message? Agreed. Yeah. But I, I'm just finding it interesting that the olive is listed first, the fig second, and the vine third. I guess the way I'm looking at it, and I'm, I'm having to ask, is this correct? Would the olive represent the third angel's message, the fig, the second, and the vine, the first? So you're saying they've been rejected in reverse order? Right. I don't know. I don't know if anybody else has thoughts on that. So when we look at this from Judges 9-11, but the fig tree said unto them, should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit to be promoted over to the trees? The second angel's message is definitely one that is a very sweet message. Because we are giving glory to our creator. 
when we're giving glory to the to our creator we find that there is good fruit now then said the trees unto the vine come thou and reign over us and the vine said unto them should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? The doctrines that we're talking about. The wine was something that was being used as a symbol. Yes, we have talked about this as doctrine, but we also see wine as being something that is day to day, but is also something for very special occasions in a literal sense. But the vine is saying, should I leave my wine? Should I abandon these doctrines that I have come to understand? Did we not observe <clears throat> in studying the Millerite time frame that the very basic doctrines, the very basic tenets of Father Miller's rules were being abandoned after 1842 when the churches began to close their doors? Well, in this article, August 4th, 1881, Ellen White says, in a most fitting and beautiful parable, uh, Jotham presented before them the folly and injustice of their course. He represented the trees as seeking to make one of their number king over them. But the olive refused to leave its oil, the fig tree its fruit, and the vine tree its wine. The worthless bramble, however, readily appropriated the honor and at once stated the conditions of its acceptance. If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come down out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Uh, the unselfish, unambitious conduct of Gideon and his sons was then forcibly portrayed, and also the ingratitude of the Shechemites. Jotham then concluded in words which proved to be a prophecy. If ye then have dwelt, dealt truly and sincerely with Jeroboam and his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come down, come out from Abimelech, and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo, and let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. So we have this fire that's going to uh, devour this message. And what would that mean? Isn't fire all consuming? Yeah, but we also have a message dealing with Nashville. Right. Fire is all consuming, but it also gives light. Mm -hmm. So the message with Nashville being light is something that is to allow those <clears throat> that live in this time to prepare, to seek to have their characters become more like Christ's. Mm -hmm. How else could we take this? Well, this other statement here, uh, truly what a striking contrast between the self-sacrificing devoted leader whom God had appointed and the monster of ingratitude and cruelty 
whom Israel had now placed upon the throne. By the olive, the fig tree, and the vine in jo Jotham's parable were represented such noble, upright characters as Moses and Joshua, who had been a living illustration of what a leader of Israel should be. Such men claimed no kingly honors. It was their work to bless their fellow men, and they did not aspire to rank or power. The worthless bramble, grasping for honor, and destroying that which was better than itself, was a fitting symbol of the vile and cruel Abimelech. Melo was the name of the Senate House or Town Hall, and by the House of Melo are meant the chief men of Shechem, who had united in making Abimelech their king, but who, according to Jotham's prophecy, were to destroy Abimelech and to be destroyed by him. And we also see, you know, that he continues for three years, etc. There's a whole bunch of things here all kinds of symbols that relate to this movement and to what we see happening in the movement. So I, I just think it's, it's very remarkable. Um, As we would compare what Mrs. White has written and what we see before us in scripture, <laughs> We are shown basically two classes. Those that seek no honor and those that grasp at honor that is not deserved. Isn't that what she said directly? Mm -hmm. When we are considering the bramble, Do we find that the bramble is capable of producing great light? Well, for a short little bit, if you burn it. Is it capable of producing warmth? For a short bit, but not for very long. Right. Does it produce wine? Or does it produce fruit such as the olive or the fig? Well, it just produces thistles and it doesn't provide shade. Isn't that very much like a false message? Mm -hmm. One of the the other examples that Mrs. White had used had to do with those that would follow Christ into the most holy place. And there are those that were praying and had and continued to pray, even though Christ had left the holy place to go into the most holy. And the adversary came and breathed upon them. They did not know that they had changed leaders. What was wrong, what was seen by Mrs. White when the adversary breathed upon those that did not advance to the most holy? Well, they received light and power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Right. Light and power. Light and heat or warmth. But no sweet love, joy, or peace. Sweet love like the sweetness of the fig. Peace like the olive and its oil. Joy like that which would be from understanding and applying correctly the doctrines of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And it does say in the Bible that wine cheereth. Correct. 
So as we look at all of these things, are we not being shown our steps in the sanctuary from the courtyard to the holy place to the most holy? Are we not being shown the necessity that we have to accept the first, the second, and the third angel's message? And can we not apply this in Judges 9 with Revelation 14? So what do people think of, of this discussion that Dwight and I mainly have been having? Um, any, any thoughts on this? Like the analogy, you know, you have, you give out an olive branch, you're sending out an olive branch, is like a symbol of peace. Mm -hmm. And wine, yes, is joy. And a fig tree. Um, that was sweetness. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. So do, do people think that this, how we're applying this judges to the present situation in the movement, is this fitting? Or are we just, you know, suffering from some kind of cognitive bias or subjective thinking? Well, there is a, an element that is quite subjective. Mm-hmm. Definitely, there's an element that's subjective. Um, but what about the objective things? I mean, is it is it subjective to take the 70 and the 69 and to apply it to the 70 weeks? And that the message of Jotham to the 70th week? Is that, I mean, because uh, to me, that it's be, quite, quite yeah, that's clear. Miller's rules. That would be following Miller's rules, you're saying? Yes. Yeah. And the story, the whole context to me would fit in. But, um, and again, we're not applying this to people. We're applying this to messages that exist within the movement. There's also a, a 6970 connection you find in the sanctuary. Okay. It's, I think it's to do with the, the pillars or the boards, whatever, the, the, the cubits, whatever it is. Um, when you add them up, you're, you can have like 69 and then you can have like a 70. There's like two half boards that combine okay. that make one. Okay. At either side. Um, I'd have to look at that. I had notes on that, but there's a, a connection there to the boards of the tabernacle. Okay. And of course, we can see the connection here then uh, to the seven times to Leviticus 26, because those are all connected. And of course, we have Mount Gerizim as well. Right and all the symbolism attached to Shechem. I mean, I don't, I mean, obviously there's could be some subjective elements in how we interpret some of these things, but there seems to me too many things that fit together. Is there anything else we're missing? Oh, so Angela just mentions the half tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. In connection with that board, is that what you were talking about? Well, you have yeah, why don't you can't, yeah, sorry, Stephen, and the rest of you. Yeah, when you mentioned the half, I thought, well, what about the half tribes of Joseph, really, Manasseh, and Ephraim? Might be a connection. I don't know. Yeah. Stephen? Well, you have half tribe of Manasseh, but you don't really apply the half tribe to Ephraim. Yeah, so, um, so how, how do you understand the half tribes? So is it Manasseh is considered the half tribe. 
and why is that? Yeah, I I guess I flubbed it a bit, but I was thinking because they had their 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 ter territory was what east and west of of Jordan. I'm not even sure. Well, Manasseh. So that's the question that I always have when it talks about the half tribe of Manasseh. Um, there's two different ways in which that could be understood. Is that Joseph is divided into Ephraim and Manasseh, and Manasseh is a half tribe. Yeah. But I tend to think yeah. that it refers to the fact that there, Manasseh's on. It, there's a western Manasseh and an eastern Manasseh, okay. and and the half tribe of Manasseh applies to the tribe on the on the east side of the Jordan. But I could be wrong. Anybody else have thoughts on that? I mean. There's two different ways in which it could be taken, I guess. Dwight, do you have any idea about how to understand the half tribe of Manasseh? I really don't. Okay. I'm having there's a lot of these symbols that that we're just now piecing together. Okay. So. Well, I okay. understand that it's just like one side's one side of the Jordan, one side's the other. Okay, that's kind of what I think, but I, I never used to think that way. But they never talk about the half tribe of Ephraim, right? So I bet. Repeat, please. I just said my bad. It was a stupid mistake. Oh, okay. Yeah, it seems to be that it's the, um, in Joshua 1, verse 12, it says, um, here, so let's go back there, Joshua 1, verse 12. Oh, my computer's locking up. Okay, there we are. Um, well, if you go where Joshua assumes command, So when he talks about, in verse 12, and to the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, spake Joshua, saying, Remember the word which the Lord, the servant of God, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest and hath given you this land. Right. So this is going to be the east side of the Jordan. So I think the half-tribe of Manasseh refers to the tribe of Manasseh on the east side of the Jordan. But anyway, this this is in relation. This all came up just dealing with this uh, the boards of the sanctuary. So whether that half board that was just brought up to this half tribe, but I don't know if there's actually a connection there anyway. But it's just something we needed to, to resolve. But I think that's the way it should be understood. Something else that just popped into my wee little mind is that. There's something about the stone crying out out in the timber answering. Where did we read that? It was just recently. Board timber, you know. Yeah, so there's uh, 46 boards. Okay. Which are, are 1.5 cubits in the tabernacle. So that would give a total of 69 cubits. And then there's two sideboards at, uh, in the corners, and they're 0.5 of a cubit each. Okay. So that would give a total of 70 cubits. Okay. So in a sense, them two side, the boards at each side, you have the sort of the arc. If you're looking to the east, you have that would be sort of like the east side, so it would be like a if they, you're going to compare the arc to being like the cross, in the okay. sense they're like in the middle, so you have like the 69 weeks with the cross. Okay. In the midst of the 70th week, so there's okay. maybe like a similar connection there. Okay, and and but the main thing here is that we're seeing this 70 as a symbol of the 70 weeks, these 70 men, and that the 70th Jotham is a symbol of the week of Christ. 
and his message is connected to the blessings and the curses or Leviticus 26 which which is exactly the message that is now being presented regarding 2030 it comes from the week of Christ's study and is connected to uh, the message of the 2300 days because 2300 months from the first day of the first month in 1844 to the first day of the first month in 2030 etc all these different connections 187 uh, prophetic years and 20 prophetic months or 186 years are all 2300 months Angela says you should put some more diagrams to deal with this Stephen oh, question I can I... hear more from you yeah. okay we have a okay. question okay Daniel oh, oh, which means that one week represents the life of Jotham okay, of okay of Jotham so there's 70 70 sons of of um, Gideon and so that would represent represent the 70 weeks. 69 are killed, that would represent the 69 weeks. So the, the 70 week would be the message that is represented by the message of Jotham. And when we did the study on the week of Christ, that's the 70th week, that was done first in 2018. And it was there that we first came to the date, uh, April 5th, 2030, the first day of the first month in 2030. But it was ignored at that time because we weren't looking that far into the future. But this message of 2030 is connected to the message of Colin, Colin and of Odilio. So their studies um, are answered by this message of April 5th, 2030. I don't know if does that, that sort of help? Does that help? Okay. Kate Dwight. Okay. So, and the bramble said under the trees, <clears throat> if in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now, as we were addressing, the bramble does not produce much for a shadow. Mm -hmm. And for a short time, it does produce fire and can produce fire. But is the fire of the bramble of sufficient strength to devour the cedars of Lebanon? I don't think so, but um, what are the cedars of Lebanon s symbolizing? I mean, it's it's a phrase that we often run into in Scripture. Right. I would ask if the cedar, if the symbol of the cedars of Lebanon is not a symbol of faith. Well, they were used in Solomon's temple. Right. Were they not were they not used both in the temple and in the uh, the king's palace? Yes, there was actually a room I think called like the Forest of Cedars, right, or something. Well. Judges 9.15 is the first time the phrase Caesars, uh, cedars of Lebanon is used. It's used in Psalms. Um, it's used in Isaiah 2.13 um, and Isaiah 14.8. It's used in um, Ezekiel 27. Um, I'm more familiar with the ones in Isaiah. Okay. Yeah, 
is the premise that cedars of Lebanon could represent faith, would that be correct or incorrect from what you're reading? Mm. I don't, I don't think I would put it as faith. Okay. Well, I, I would in the sense that this is a tree that endures. It's really a tough tree. And our faith is supposed to endure. Well, it's used, it's, it's used often to refer to those that are proud in Isaiah. What is one thing that is fairly well noted about cedar? Well, it doesn't rot, and, and insects, um, it's, it's a natural pesticide. Yeah, insects don't like it, and it does not rot. Yeah. And you don't want to breathe it into your lungs. You can get, uh, if you're sawing up cedar boards, you wear a mask. Because I've, 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 in the sawmill, I, I've cut cedar before. Right. Okay. Now, therefore, if ye have done truly and sincerely in that ye have made Abimelech king, and ye have dwelt well with Jerubal and his house, and have done unto him according to the deserving of his hands, so if you have done, if you have treated Gideon in the manner that you should, if you have respected the work that he has done on your behalf, and this is the, what should be done in making Abimelech king. And he goes on to note, for my father fought for you and adventured his life far and delivered you out of the hand of Midian. Gideon put his life on the line for you. Gideon stood between you and destruction. Gideon stood between you and starvation. So if you have done truly and sincerely in that you have made Abimelech king, is this what should be expected from the service of Gideon? Well, not really. Um, now, it's still interesting. I know I, I always keep jumping ahead or going behind here, but, you know, he's going to mention the slaying of the three score and ten sons or persons right. upon one stone, though he is not slain, but he's still going to include himself in that number, which I find interesting. Well, that would take us to First John 3.15, where it says that everyone who, who, who hates his brother is a murderer. Murder was in their hearts. Well, and people that were behind the slaying of those sons. Yeah, they wanted to uh, kill all 70. They just didn't succeed. But as we, as we spoke also, they killed these upon the stone. Yeah. As ye are risen up against my father's house this day, as you are destroying the house of the man that saved you, and you have slain his sons, three score and ten persons upon one stone. He's including himself with those that are slain. Mm -hmm. He is including himself much as a prophet that spoke more for our time than his own. Mm -hmm. But he is noting that the men of Shechem 
under the direction of a false message are removing that which has been done on their behalf. For they are slaying three score and ten upon one stone and have made Abimelech the false message, the son of his maidservant, the son of his concubine, king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. I was also questioning what stone that was, because the angel burned up, up the offering on a certain rock, and I was wondering if this blasphemous murderer slew those sons on that same rock. Haven't found anything yet to confirm that, but I was pondering. I'm, I'm having to think he, it's more the stone that Joshua erected to remind them in Ophrah of God's law and that they were not to take themselves away from this law. That they were, I mean, in, in this situation, they slew 69 men. They slew, the, they slew 69 of the sons of Gideon. Was this done righteously or unrighteously? If unrighteously, then were they not countering the commandment that says thou shalt not kill? And in so doing, setting aside the Ten Commandments. Amen. So if they were doing this on the stone that Joshua had erected, then they were not only setting aside the words of Moses, but they were setting aside the words of Joshua and the words of Gideon. Here again, they were setting aside the testimony of three, the first, the second, and the third angel's message. Where, where is it that uh, Joshua sets up a stone on Ophrah? Oh, just a moment. Isn't it in Shechem? Just a moment. Yeah, I don't think it's in Ophrah. I think it's in Shechem. Then I, I stand corrected. Because this stone, wouldn't this be in Shechem? I'm looking. You are correct. Joshua 24, 25. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak, which that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. Yeah. And Joshua said unto the people, behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us. For it hath heard all the words of the Lord, which he spoke unto us. It shall therefore be a witness unto you, lest you deny your God. So you're correct. This yeah. was set up in Shechem. Now in Judges 9.5, when it talks about um, Abimelech and these people he hired going to Ophrah, and he slew his brethren, the sons of Jeroboam or Gideon, being three score and ten persons upon one stone, notwithstanding yet Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left, for he hid himself. So here we have 
uh, this stone on one stone. Now, the stone may be in Oprah. So if it's in Oprah, um, Ophrah, then it's not in Shechem, obviously. Um, so, so we don't know, though, whether they were captured and brought there and killed there. So we're not really sure what this one stone is. So it's, but I, I would think it's in Ophrah. I would think that's the most likely that he's going to kill them there. But they're going to gather at the house of Milo and make Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. So it's going to be in Shechem that Abimelech is made king, and that's when Jotham is going to stand up on Mount Gerizim and give this prophecy. Aren't Ophrah and Shechem both fairly close to Gerizim and Ebal? Yeah, they're not far apart. I don't know exactly how far. Okay. Six miles apart, 10 kilometers, I think. Yeah, six miles southwest of Shechem. So it's not, they're, they're not that far apart, but in being six miles, you have the number of a man. In being 10 kilometers, you have the number of judgment. So, If ye then have dwelt truly and sincerely with Jerubal and with his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. If you have honored the memory of Gideon and his service to you, and the restoration that he brought for you for 40 years. Then rejoice in your newfound ruler in this message. And let this message be a comfort to you. But if not, let fire come from this message and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo, and let the fire come from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. If this is not right, let both the message and the messenger be destroyed. As we see in Revelation, and as we understand from the writings of Sister White, at the very end, the adversary will be consumed root and branch. Correct? So would this not be another symbolic application to what we're reading in Judges 9.20? Anybody have a comment on that question? 
Can you state the question again? Okay. In this situation where we have this false message, if you have dwelt truly and sincerely with the message of July 18th and with the import of this message this day, then rejoice ye in the message that is current, the message that is being given. And let this message find joy in you. But if not, let fire come from Abimelech, from this message that is against July 18th, and may it devour the men of Shechem, those that oppose the message of July 18th, and the house of Milo, those that govern, and let, the, and let fire come out from those that oppose the message of July 18th, and from those that govern and devour the message that is against July 18th. Would this not also be similar to what we've read in Revelation and from this from Sister White, that at the end, that the adversary would be devoured both root and branch? I can relate to that root and branch, certainly. Um, we know that a fire, in a sense, is uh, Satan. There's a fire that comes out of him and devours him. Um, I'm not sure as to the application concerning the message of July 18 to this. Well, wouldn't it have to be about the message of July 18th? And the, the like, like there is, this is definitely in, in opposition to the message of July 18th, the, the making of Bimelech king. Wouldn't it have to be in connection with that? Yeah, I don't really see... Uh, strong enough connections. Okay, so I'm not sure. okay, we'll look at s some of the connections here that we have. So we do have the seventy persons, and we have the seventieth week, right? You would agree with that 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 analogy? Yes. Connection. Okay. We also have the blessings and curses, the place where those are given. So that would connect, connect us with Leviticus 26. Mm -hmm. And we, we know that the message of Gideon is the message of July 18th. There we have all kinds of symbols connecting it to July 18th, right? There is some, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I was thinking more. Well, we have Jeff. We, we had typified him as Gideon. And, right. um, so, so in our application of how we've done this in the past, we looked at Jeff as Gideon. And we're going to still keep that idea because Jeff, FFA, is going to give the message of July 18th. Mm -hmm. Right? Because even though, you know, I found July 18th, I'm not the one giving that message it's going to be Jeff giving that message. And, and even in a sense, FFA, Jeff is part of FFA, but FFA is not totally behind it because once July 18th passes, it really has rejected the message. It never fully accepted July 18th. Jeff seems to be the only one who really understood its import in FFA. 
I mean, people went along with it, but I don't think they really understood it. So we still would have Gideon representing Jeff giving the message of July 18th. Right? So, mm -hmm. and we don't really have Gideon being a person. It's a message, a specific message at a specific time. And we know it's also the message of the Sunday law. But Jeff gives the message of the Sunday law in predicting the pandemic. Because the pandemic is a type of the Sunday law. Would you agree with that? Yes, you had um, Mellorites having 300 charts. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff typifying Miller. Yeah. So there's that connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, and, and we have, so we have it in the broader sense. Because remember, as we look at these lines, we can see that we can zoom into each of these way marks. And so there are different levels in which we can look at the story of Gideon. And Jeff looked at it a bit more zoomed out. Correct? Mm -hmm. Right. But we're looking at it a bit more zoomed in. And in this context, then, to take this story of the 70 sons of Gideon, it would have to follow this message of Gideon. So it has to follow the message of July 18th and what, what occurred afterwards. And, and the only thing that I can see that would fit is the message of the 70th week. That that has to be the message of Jotham. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the message of the 70th week is coming in response to the rejection. Now, when we say the rejection of July 18th, one of the things we see is that both Colin and Odilio aren't rejecting July 18th in any sort of open way. That is, Odilio still is accepting July 18th, so is Colin. But it's not so much them or even what they're presenting that's the problem. It's all of the other things around it. Would you agree with me on that point? So are you saying that who who would be Abimelech representing? Would he not well, be Perminder well, or something? No, because that's 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 earlier. So this Abimelech is representing the message because this is now not one of the enemies that was left behind to test us, which Parminder was one of those enemies that was left behind, right? To prove us. But Abimelech is something that happens specifically within this movement in connection with the message of Gideon, which is the message of Jeff, which he gave regarding July 18th. So Abimelech is a message that in, in some ways is rejecting July 18th, but not fully, right? Because Abimelech is still you know, a son of a concubine of Gideon. And he's trying to say that his is the correct message. It's trying to sell itself as the correct message. But the argument and the, what we're studying that Dwight had put forward is that this is a counterfeit third angel's message. It's counterfeiting uh, the message that we're supposed to give. And that would parallel with what we see happening. It would parallel with the August 8th, 1881, uh, Signs of the Time article in L. White, what we see happening in the movement today. And I know some people are a little bit disconnected from what's happening. That is, you know, unless you're really following um, closely with what's being said about the message of July 18th and all of the other things connected with it. Um, you may not know all of the things happening behind the scenes, but some of those, you know, we've shared and some you have seen. I mean, if anybody watched the, the presentation I did uh, on the, um, yeah, so here, you know, Angela brings up the gossip and that's part of what happened. So when we looked at uh, the way that the message was being attacked, it was never attacked in an open manner that it was always attacking the messengers, misrepresentation, 
of of people, gossip, rumors, um, beliefs being repeated about things that happen, and much of it untrue. But as I have recordings of discussions that were going on about me um, on Sabbath afternoon that are completely misrepresentations of, of, of reality. That is, those things didn't happen, those attitudes didn't occur, but people are are basically similar to what happened in 1888 with Jones and Wagner's message. Instead of addressing the message of Jones and Wagner, they just attacked the messengers. So we see the same thing happening today. And, and the thing that we're, we're looking at when we look at this whole issue is that everything has to be studied completely. That is what this movement has to do is come together and study in the spirit of Christ and abandon all of this type of gossip and misrepresentation and shunning and you know disfellowshipping which is not even done in an official way it's done in a sort of a ad hoc way people are just shut out uh, from being able to speak or have a voice in the movement because because of personal reasons instead of looking at the message itself and so to me from my perspective this it seems to be describing exactly the condition of the movement. But we're not looking at individuals here. We're not looking at Abimelech represents some individual or um, Jotham represents some individual. They represent messages that are occurring presently. Um, you know, so we have this making Abimelech king is, is putting some emphasis upon a message that is a false message rather than the three angels' messages. That is, the three angels' messages are rejected in order to have this false third angels' message. That, that's, that's the premise that Dwight began with, is that when we're looking at this message, of anointing Abimelech as king, it's a counterfeit third angel's message. And I personally see it in what's being taught regarding righteousness by faith and regarding medical missionary work in this movement. The two manifestations we have of the medical missionary work and of the message of righteousness by faith presently in the movement are things that Jeff constantly opposed in his ministry. That is, he, he would not, if Jeff were here today, he would not recognize what's being presented as correct in regard to righteousness by faith and in regard to the medical missionary work. That's my belief, based on my knowledge of what Jeff has said in the past and how he reacted to these teachings in the past. But people are going to have to figure that out for themselves and decide. But that, that, that's how I understand it. And that's not different from what I understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, at, at this point, there are so many things that we're seeing that are happening currently within the movement that Elder Jeff would have stood up to and been very blunt about. Mm -hmm. Well, because I see exactly what happened in 2010 with what was being taught and his views on it, with what was being taught, what's, which what is presently being taught as righteousness by faith in the movement today. It's exactly the same message, and Jeff would have had the same opinion. He wouldn't have changed his views. Right. And also with the medical missionary work, how he has responded to it in the past, what would try to pass itself off as the medical missionary work, Jeff would not have accepted what we see presently. And because the medical missionary work is important, but it has to be the true medical missionary work that Alan White lays out, not some new age counterfeit. At this point, <clears throat> 
I have encountered with many that have been within the movement, their comments that a third angel's message or the third angel's message is being preached at this location, or it's being preached by this ministry, and we need to support these, 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 all over the place. All these different ministries that aren't connected with this movement. Right, e yeah. exactly. Which Jeff would not have accepted. Agreed. Yeah, he actually constantly spoke against that. Now. He would always bring up, you know, what about this ministry? What about that ministry? And Jeff would just say, they're not part of our, our message. We have a situation from the Bible. Mm -hmm. where we are told lo here is christ or lo here is christ christ is the message of revelation 14 that is the gospel that is the good news we do not have this occurring in all of these different areas because if they had been correct, if these had truly been of Christ, then these would be making the changes in the character of those that are hearing these messages. But those changes are not occurring. The third angel's message, the, the messages of Revelation 14, are presenting before us the need for the change in our characters. When these changes have occurred and this message goes forth with its true power, it will have been done where the Spirit of God has come upon those to give this message so that people can make their decision. Are they willing to stand under the banner of Prince Emmanuel or are they going to stand under the black banner of the great apostate? And of course, the way that we know that we're following Christ is the spirit that we manifest towards our brethren. Amen. Very much agreed. Now, we have a couple of verses we need to finish with, but our time for today and for this week is now ended. Do we have other comments or questions that we need to address? And we will take this back up again Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, well, we're going to have to come back to this Sunday morning. So um, are we going to uh, – we're going to have to move ahead, though, too. We're not going to just – No, we're, we're going to be moving ahead because we want to get further into this book of Judges 9. Yeah. Yeah, there because there's a lot here. Again, just like there. Um, so at this point, <clears throat> in your preparation, consider the fact that Jotham ran away. Mm -hmm. But we are now going to be looking, starting from Judges 9.22, I would say likely to Judges 9.29 and begin that on Sunday. Okay. All right? Yeah. So, any other comments or questions? Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father, we thank you 
for the examples, for the consideration and for the blessings that are coming from the study of this section of Judges 9. Help us to carefully consider these items. Help us to keep our eyes upon you, to be directed in all that you would have us to do. Help us to be examples of you in all that we do this day. Be with us now in all things. Show us that that you would have us to do to glorify you with all with whom we come in contact. For this, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.